Okay. Well, if you've got your Bibles there, open them up to Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 26. I started on this last week and I figured I may as well finish the chapter. Um, it's definitely worth finishing, in my opinion, anyway. So good morning. Morning to everyone online. Back in 2006, a really well-known experiment was done, a case study, to see what effect... Uh, a landscape architect actually did this, to see what effect fencing would have on a, children, on a child's playground experience. It's called the playground experiment. Has anyone heard of it? Okay, me and maybe one or two others. Okay, it doesn't matter. Anyway, it's a really famous experiment. So what they did was they took the same group of kids to two different playgrounds. One playground had all the equipment, obviously, and was surrounded by a really good fence. And they took the kids to another playground that had all the equipment but didn't have a fence. And what they found was that when they took the kids to the playground with the fence, the kids spread out all over the place, right up to the boundary of the fence. But when they took the kids to the playground without the fence, the kids decided to sort of clump in the middle around the teacher and didn't want to explore further. And so the upshot with this was that, well, fences kind of bring freedom, right? When we, we know there are boundaries, we feel safe to explore. So a bunch of people kind of extrapolated that out and thought that they could apply it into all sorts of spheres of life where maybe not literal fences but metaphorical fences like rules and procedures and stuff. The idea being that when people know where the lines are, they're going to feel freer to explore. Not so much. Because what they found in business at least was that the more rules and procedures and lines they laid on people, the less cooperation, the less productivity, the less efficiency, the lower morale, all started to creep in. And what they found was exactly the opposite of the playground experience. If they had a strong centre of shared goals and values with only the minimal kind of rules around things to keep things legal and ethical, right, it actually produced greater productivity, greater morale, greater efficiency. Now, in saying this, I'm not suggesting for one second that all rules are bad, right? Rules are necessary. I, for one, on the road, am very grateful that rules exist, right? Now, I realise some people think that they are optional, but they're not, okay? Anyone drive in the northwest of Sydney? Okay. You're lucky we're here half the time. It is absolutely deadly. So not all rules are bad. And we have rules here too of necessity, right? We have rules around child safety and WH&S. We have kind of unspoken rules about what is and isn't appropriate behaviour around here. Um, and if you wonder what that is, do something and find out, all right? Um, so, you know, rules, rules can actually be good, but wrongly, too many of them and wrongly applied can actually really begin to stifle the life out of a place. And that's what we want to be careful about. Now, let me tell you another story as well. If you've ever been up into the north of Australia, up into the really north of Queensland or the Northern Territory, you'll know that there are some big cattle stations up there. Has anyone ever seen that? Mm, okay, I have. And what you'll notice about these big cattle stations is that they are so big. Right? They're the size of some small countries, these things. They're massive. And they've got lots of cows, but the one thing they don't have is fences. And the reason they don't have fences is because it's too big to fence. So you think, well, how do they keep the cows from just wandering off into the never-never? Well, what they do is dig a series of deep wells. And so there are these watering holes strategically placed all over the property. And what they find is that the cows are free to roam. They're free to go wherever they want. But they never stray too far because they always want to be close to the water. Now, what's that got to do with us? Churches can be easily be places with lots of fences and lots of rules, like we were talking about last week, instead of a deep centre. And it's tempting for us to do because it's an easy thing to do. It's an easy thing to do to come up with a list of rules to get people to comply or to conform to certain norms around the place. It produces quick results. People want to do it to fit in, and there's this sense in which we feel like we are protecting ourselves in some sort of way. But it ends up stifling the real fullness of life 
that Jesus actually came to bring. In fact, it was Paul, the guy who wrote this letter to the Galatians, who says that the, the, the letter actually kills. What he's saying is the law, when you get into rules, like they actually kill the human spirit. But it is the Spirit of God who gives life. And we kind of have this choice whether we're going to live by the letter of the law or whether we're going to live by the Spirit. So this morning what I want to talk about is forget the lines and stay near the centre. Because the antidote to a church with a bunch of lines and fences isn't a church with nothing at all. It's a church with a very deep and clear centre. Now if you weren't here last week, I worked through the first six verses of Galatians 5. And just in case you weren't here, I'm going to do a really quick recap. Paul had planted this church in Galatia. It was made up of the um, the Celtic tribes in Turkey. And they were Jewish and Gentile converts to Christianity that made up this church. And they got along just fine until some people that Paul calls Judaizers, they were Jewish converts to Christianity, had come down and decided that they didn't like what was going on. They didn't like the fact that Paul was preaching this message of grace, which was based on Jesus alone. So your identity, your inclusion and your belonging, that rested entirely on Jesus and the work of Jesus and nothing else. And these guys said, no, 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 that's not good enough. You need to be circumcised and you need to obey the law of Moses. In other words, you need to become Jewish to be a Christian around here. And so what happened was not only were people getting wobbly about whether where they stood with God, am I saved or am I not, am I doing enough or am I not? It put a big split down the middle of this church that had once been quite happy to be together. And the people who were following these rules and who decided to buy in, the Jewish Christians, they began to hive off and be able to say to the Gentile Christians, you can't be around us, you can't eat with us, you can't socialize with us, you can't even be part of this church until you meet all the rules that we've actually met. And Paul begins to push back on that really, really strongly to let them know in no uncertain terms, your inclusion, your belonging and your identity is rooted in Jesus and it's in nothing else. Pushing back is a mild way of saying it. He gets so upset. He says to them in the preceding chapters of the verse we're going to look at today, he says to them, who cut in on you? You were running a good race, right? You guys were doing really well. Who has knocked you off course? It wasn't God. But whoever it is, he says, whoever it is, there's going to be consequences and you're going to pay them. And as for these people who are going around telling the males over here that they need to be circumcised in order to belong, I hope that they go the whole way and cut their entire bits off. (laughs) Paul says it's in the Bible. So if ever I say that to you, I've got biblical backing for it, right? (laughs) Sometimes we think that, that because people in the Bible are just a little bit soft and they're not. When it comes to really important things, they get really riled up. And this was really important to Paul. Why? Because he was someone who had experienced himself and was telling these guys, everything about Christianity is about Jesus. Again, your identity, your inclusion, your belonging, your salvation, it's all about Jesus. How dare you come along and start to tell people it's about something else? that it's about following the rules, that it's about running through hoops, that it's about meeting all these criteria. How dare you do that? He gets really, really angry and says, you know, go and like eunuch yourself, all right? It's okay to be angry. There is such a thing as righteous anger when we're, you know, it's okay to be angry about the right things. Jesus was angry once. You remember right towards the end of his ministry, he goes to the temple And he starts tipping over tables, which is really un-Jesus-like. But he does that because these people, again, were preventing people from coming to God. They were putting an impediment in the way. So it's okay to be upset about things. The problem for us is that most churches today is we get angry at all the wrong things and all the wrong people. We do. And we flip tables that we should actually be sitting at and we sit at tables we should be flipping. So it's just about making sure that when we're going to get angry, we get angry at the right thing and for the right reason. Anyway, Paul's angry at them for damaging the church and giving them, moving them away from grace and introducing a whole lot more rules and law to their church. And their argument was the same thing you come up against in today's churches. And that is, if you preach grace, if you tell people that you are saved by faith and grace alone through Jesus, then 
that's kind of dangerous because people don't know where the lines are and they're going to be tempted to, be, to misbehave. And this is exactly a problem that Paul encountered and he has to talk to the, writes in his letter to the Romans where he says, he's preaching about grace and then one of the things he goes, just because of grace, shall we go on sinning? The idea being that if you really preach grace, if you really live grace, then, then everyone should genuinely get the idea it doesn't matter what you do, right? Because it really is all about grace. That's the idea. It doesn't mean that that's true, but that should provoke be, be provoked in people. Hey, if it's just by grace and it doesn't matter what we do. Well, it does, and we're going to see that in a minute. But this is their argument. Their argument is if you talk to people about real grace, they're going to go, then I'm free to do whatever I want. We need rules to keep people in line. If it's all grace, how do people know where the line is? How do they know when they've crossed it? How do we know when they've crossed it? How do we, how do we know where, how to evaluate whether someone's actually walking with God and not walking with God? You know, if it's all grace, like you say, Paul, then pretty much anything is going to go. See, they just didn't want the big boundaries to be able to, uh, as a criteria for salvation and identity and, and belonging. They wanted the boundaries, they wanted the rules and the fences to be able to control people's behaviour as well. They wanted everyone to sort of march in step and to be in sync. And that's why I said to you last week, with churches with lots of rules, it always looks nice. Because for the most part, everyone's conforming, right? Everyone's conforming to those rules because they want to fit in. But it's lifeless, it's not motivated by this intrinsic desire to want to do what is right and good and loving and kind. It is motivated by external pressure and external code to conform or comport to some type of behaviour. It's like the North Korean version of church. Have you ever seen how when people are taken around North Korea on a tour, everything looks fantastic? It's like the Potomkin villages back in the day in Russia as well. Fake villages that were built to show everyone, look how prosperous we are. It was all just a lie. It was all just external. But that's what these guys in the end they wanted. They wanted lifeless conformity to rules rather than a potentially messy, life-filled church that comes through grace. But here's the thing about rules. They make us feel like control, that, that we have control, but we actually don't have control. Because as I said, it's only ever conformity to an external code. It's not people genuinely being internally motivated to do the right thing. So they're only ever going to behave when they're around to be seen. And it's not going to extend into other parts of their life. And it doesn't go very far. It's a very poor motivator. It's a bare minimum approach. Rules are about curbing and eliminating bad behaviour. They're not about promoting great behaviour. They're not about trying to bring the best out in people. And the other thing is, people will always push the limits of rules. They'll always test the fence to see how strong it is and how far it runs. Does anyone else get, when you get told not to do something, feel like that's exactly what you want to do? <laughs> yeah? It's, it's true. There's biblical precedent for this. You can eat, in the beginning, you can eat of any tree in the garden, just not that one. You know what? I really want to eat from that tree. <laughs> It's, it, and Paul talks about this too. He says what the law does is it awakens our desire to do the wrong thing. He says that's what it does. It just brings it out in us. The, the don't eat the apple becomes I, I want to eat the apple. So we have this, we're always going to push back in some way. We might conform and comport for a while, but after a while we want to start testing the boundaries. And when I was in, when I was in the army, which is an organisation necessarily of lots of rules, right... It got to the stage in the latter part of my career where I decided I didn't want to play the game anymore. And I was going to push it as far as I possibly could. And so me and some friends, we started a band and we would play the pubs and clubs and, and universities and you know get up to all sorts of no good. And the army knew all about it and would often be called in to explain what we were up to. And then I thought, okay, what's some other ways? Little, just little minor transgressions that I can do to get away with. And we thought, ah, we, me and a friend came up with a beauty. The army have these really strict rules about haircuts, right? You had to have a short back and sides. Anyone old enough to remember what a short back and sides is? I mean, these days, when I look at people's haircuts, especially guys, it's like, you could easily be in the army, all these fades and stuff, you know, like, it's fine. But when I was young, yeah, long hair was quite a thing, right? Anyway, so you had to be 
X amount of, of centimetres above your ear. It had to be, you know, tapered at the back and, and two inches above your collar and everything. We're like, yeah, that's exactly right. But he didn't say anything about how long the top of my hair could be. Now, this is going to take some creative imagining for you because I don't have much hair these days. But in those days, I did. And so me and a friend grew the top of our hair as long as we possibly could, right? And it got to the point where we'd get our slouch hats and we'd have to do this to get our hair under the hat. So when we had our hats on or our berets or our helmets, whatever it was, we had a perfect military haircut. But when we took our hats off... And one day we took our hats off in front of the wrong person. And we got yelled at and screamed at, as that's an understatement. And we were told to immediately go and get a haircut, which I did. And I got a flat top. Has anyone seen flat tops? So I got a flat top. And that's fine, because you look like a marine or something, you know. So I got this flat top done. And then I went and got it bleached. <laughs> so again, it looked perfectly normal. But up here was pure white. And that was fine until I took my hat off in front of the wrong person again. And that time, they marched me up to the cells, right? Because I'd been very, very naughty. But, but he, this is my point. When our hearts are not aligned with a thing, rules are just going to evoke the desire to push back in some way. They are. They're not going to control our behaviour. Like I say, we might conform, we might comport just to get by, keep the peace, whatever, but largely if our hearts are not engaged, the rules are only ever going to serve to awaken this desire to be a little bit of a pain. So if we're relying on rules to keep people in line, we've not only lost the battle, we're missing the point. But freedom is dangerous too. These legalistic guys who wanted to add these layers of laws and rules they were not wrong in understanding that telling people they were free, there's a danger to that. There are no rules and no lines to cross. I, I, you could interpret it, well, then I'm free to do whatever I want. Isn't that what you're saying? No, this is not what's being said when we talk about freedom, which is Paul, why Paul handles it like this. So in Galatians 5, verse 13, he says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. So Paul points out that freedom from the law does not now mean that we are free to do as we want. Rather... Now that we have been set free by Jesus and all that other stuff that used to compel us and pull us and shape us and pressure us, we are now free to do as we ought. How we handle this freedom matters a lot. And this freedom is not what we in our Western individualistic way of seeing the world is. When we think of freedom, we immediately go to I am free to be me. I am free to be my authentic self, you know, to experience full autonomy, independence from other people, to give full reign and expression to me, right? And, and that is not what Paul is talking about at all. It's that idea that, that to be free means that we can be our truly unimpeded self isn't even true outside of the church. We live in a society and of necessity we have to rein in some of our desires and behaviours, right? We just have to, otherwise it's not a functional society anymore. So, so this idea that I am free, I'm free from obligation, I'm free from responsibility, no, that's not what Paul is talking about at all. For him and for us here, freedom doesn't lessen our commitment and our responsibility to others, nor does it lessen our commitment to the law, rather it increases our ability to serve others in love and more thoroughly fulfil the law. What is the law Paul is talking about? The law of love. He says the entire scriptures can be fulfilled in this one law. And when he says that, the entire law can be fulfilled in this one command, he's talking about the... Uh, the um, the, the Pentateuch and uh, you know, the Torah, and he's talking about the prophets. The law and the prophets is a shorthand way of saying the Old Testament. He's saying the entire Old Testament is summed up in this one command, love your neighbour as yourself. 
But when you do that, you're actually fulfilling the law. So it's not in these 101 or 1,001 and million and one little rules that we have around here. It's in this one big one. Love your neighbour as yourself. And if you live by that kind of, by that creed and by that approach to life, you will end up fulfilling the entire law. He says, don't use your freedom, like don't use the lack of rules that I insist on around here to indulge your flesh, rather use it to serve one another in love. And it's like I was talking about, I don't know, a month ago maybe. It's the difference, what Paul's talking about is the difference between have to and want to, right? The law is about have to. Love is about want to, right? And guess what God wants for us? He wants us to want to. The life Jesus came to give us is a life of want to, not have to, right? This is, this is really, really important. That's why you will never hear us around here say, you must. You must tithe. You must come to church every Sunday. You must join a connect group. You must serve. You'll never hear us say that at all. You know why? Because it's just self-defeating. What we want is for you to want to do these things. Right? Not to force you to do them. Not to say, here's the bar, jump over it, hooray, now you can be one of us. No, we want you to want to do these things. You never hear me say, you have to turn up to church on time. (laughs) You hear me whine about it a lot, (laughs) but you've never heard me say, you must, because that's self-defeating. I want you to want to. Rather than say you have to be here at 10 o'clock, I want you to think about it like this. This, doing that, is an act of love. It is serving other people when I do that. It's not just honouring the people who are on the stage here to lead worship, not to an empty auditorium, but to the people. It's getting here early in case there are people here that we can welcome and greet and pray with and talk to, right? It's, it's not about, I know everyone thinks this is about my, I've never, you know, you can take the boy out of the army, but you can't take the army out of the boy, right? That's not what's going on here, okay? This is something I feel strongly about because I think it is about love and I think it is about honour. And so I could say, you have to, but I'm, not, I'm never going to do that. I'm going to ask you a question. Why is it you don't want to? Why is it that it's not important enough for you to do? That's a tougher question to answer, isn't it? And this is the issue, and this is what I meant. This is the issue between law and grace. Law asks easy questions of us. Grace asks incredibly hard questions of us because they're issues of the heart. They're not just issues of behaviour. They're issues of the heart. It's not just about why, you know, why haven't you done X, Y, and Z? It's like, why don't you want to? And that takes a lot more work, doesn't it? See, one of the, one of the great misunderstandings is that, 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 that law demands more of us than grace. No, no, grace always demands more of us than law. Always. Even in the example of giving, you know, you can talk about tithing. And incidentally, I've been quite, it's on our website and I'm quite clear, I don't believe tithing is actually binding on Christians. I don't. I think it's a good practice and you're welcome to do it. That's fine. But, but the New Testament talks more about generosity. You, you, know the, you can see the difference there? Tithing stops at 10%. Generosity has no end. Tithing, tithing says, give to your church 10%. Responsibility fulfilled. Generosity says, uh-uh-uh. Yeah, give to your church. But what if there's someone in your congregation that's in need? See, it's, grace will always ask more of us than law. Always ask more of us than law. So the issue in all these examples that I've given you, and there are more, is not one of compliance, it is one of desire. So the work to be done in all of us, when we find that there are things where we're not kind of doing the things we need to be doing or should be doing, we need to ask ourselves, what is going on in here and why is that? And that may be a bit of a process that you need to work through. And don't listen, I want to say this really clearly, no guilt. Because we're all working through stuff. And you need to be free to work through that at your own pace. There's no way that I'm standing here saying, 
work through it. And if you haven't turned up by 10 o'clock next week, I'm going to assume you haven't, right? I will assume you haven't, but I will also give you grace as well, okay? No, seriously, no judgment. You, you, because what I want, again, is not for you to be pressured. I want you to go away and do the work that's required in here to ask, if there are things that I think I could do better, why aren't I doing them? What will it take? Get to the heart of the issue. Anyway, let's, let's press on. It sounds great, right? But there is, Paul makes it really clear that we constantly live with this tension between two forces that are operative both in our life and external to us. He calls it the flesh and the spirit. And we're pulled from one to the other. We're constantly pulled in this. Sometimes we're more oriented towards being pulled by the spirit. Other times we're more oriented to being pulled by the flesh. So he says... Walk by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you, you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. So the struggle is real, right? Being a follower of Jesus, the struggle is real. And it is often about our choices in any given moment. Just because we're free doesn't mean that there isn't a pressure for us to want to go one way or the other. So we come across these things like, do I give back as good as I got? Or do I actually forgive and bless someone? Do I make an effort with that person? Do I just let them fade into the the past? Do I get out of bed or do I hit the snooze button for the 10th time? Do I inconvenience myself for others or do I look after number one? Do I live from my new identity as a new creation or do I just continue to live the way I've always lived? Do I live like everyone else in the world or do I live like I am the citizen of another kingdom? These are the choices we make all the time. And what's his solution to this struggle? It is not rules and more rules. No, he says the solution is to walk with the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit, to be immersed in the Spirit and to be led by the Spirit of Jesus. See, as I said, rules neither have the the power to prevent bad behaviour and they don't have the power to promote good behaviour. That comes from somewhere else. That comes from the Spirit of God at work within our heart. That's why Paul says, walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit. Be close to the Spirit, be centred in Jesus and these choices will not only be animated, they will be empowered to do the right thing. We're not expected to do this in our own strength and effort. You know, one of the arguments for lots of rules around things is, you know, again, it's really easy when we have rules to see when someone crosses the line, right? That's how we know who's, who's kind of in and who's kind of out and who's doing well and who's not. To which Paul says, you don't need rules to see that, you just need eyes, He goes on to say the acts of the flesh are obvious and then he lists a whole bunch of things which are very un-Jesus-like ways of living. And he says when you see people living like that, you know which force they've given into. They have not decided to walk with the Spirit of God, they've decided to walk in the flesh and according to the powers of the flesh. So he, he goes on to then say, this isn't the first time I've warned you, you know, If you use your freedom this way, that is, to just please yourself and to just do all that stuff, you will not inherit God's kingdom. Now, let me be clear about this, because sometimes we can hear this stuff and we go, we're going to be doomed if we make a mistake. That's not what is being said here. This is not about making a mistake. This is not about messing up. This is not about getting it wrong. Okay? We're all going to do that from time to time. We are all going to do that from time to time. There are days where we're going to feel like we could walk a thousand miles in the spirit and other days where we're really struggling and we just like give up and walk in the flesh. Anyone? Yeah, okay, just me. That's fine. (coughs) I'm the only one with any authenticity and honesty around here. So It's hard. It's hard. You know, anyway. Paul, goes, Paul says, look, it's not, about, it's not about a mistake, it's not messing up. Those who live like this, the word live is the Greek word praso, which means practice, which means perform habitually and continue to practice. There is this present continuous ongoing tense of this, where it's like the people who just continue to ignore the impulse of the spirit to do the loving things and just choose to serve themselves all the time, they're the people that have stepped 
out of the way of God and are in danger of not inheriting the kingdom. So we all mess up up from time to time. The love of God is not a tightrope that if we make a mistake, we fall off it, right? We're all going to fall off it from time to time. We're all going to make mistakes. But the grace of God is big enough to hold us in that. And John says, 1 John 1, 9, if we, if we, are, you know, we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. What I don't like seeing is people who make mistakes and then conclude that they've messed up so bad that somehow God is going to be mad at them and he doesn't want to be around them anymore and they withdraw and they isolate themselves. Don't do that. You made a mistake. Get right before God and keep going. The only time this becomes dangerous is when you begin to persist in these things. And it's more likely if you isolate yourself and withdraw that you are going to persist in these things, right? That's why community is important because we are to help one another along. In fact, Paul talks about this in Galatians. When when you who are spiritual see someone who is struggling, get alongside them and help them. And he's not saying you who are more spiritual than that. It's, It's just a way of saying you who are doing okay, Get alongside the people who are not doing okay because we all need support and encouragement from time to time, yes? We all do because sometimes we're just weak. Sometimes life just presses in on us and and it's all we can do to stand. And sometimes we just need people to help us along with all of that. So what's Paul's answer to this? Try harder? Nope. If you want to avoid living this way, that's going to lead you in a way that is leading you away from the kingdom of God and into this selfish, unkingdom like way. What's the solution? Uh, try harder? No, draw closer. That's your solution, draw closer. See, how we live matters, and the difference, the difference maker is not rules, it's relationship. Right? It's relationship. The closer you are to the centre, the closer you are to Jesus, the more inclined you are to live like Jesus the more of Jesus will be in you. See, Paul frames it as the fruit of the Spirit. He says, just as the fruit of, of, not, of walking in the flesh is obvious, the fruit of being around Jesus and the Spirit living in you is obvious too. What's it look like? Well, it looks like peace. It looks like patience. It looks like kindness, gentleness, self-control. That's what it looks like. So it's easy to tell how people are going because we wear it all over our life. It it flows out of us. The fruit of selfishness flows out of us and the fruit of the Spirit flows out of us. And Paul says, if you want to avoid living like this and you want to live like this, then don't try harder, just draw closer. Get closer to Jesus. Fill yourself with the Spirit every single day. What was that famous line says, "Why, why do we need filling with the Spirit every day? Well, because I leak, right? We do, we leak. And we need to constantly be filled and to be refilled so that that love of God can abide in our heart, that it can flow out of us towards others. Because guess what? I don't possess that in and of myself. And neither do you. And we're called to this this incredibly high life of love and grace. That's That's got to come from somewhere else other than here. right? And it does. It comes from the Spirit of God living within us. And so the way to do that, again, not run harder, not try hard, just draw closer to the centre. Spend time in the presence of Jesus. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in the Word. Spend time in worship. Spend time just listening. Focus on Him. Because ultimately we, we become what we behold. So let me just finish by saying this, because I do need to finish. <clears throat> in Galatians, one of the things Paul talks about here is this. The law, he says, the purpose of the law was to act like a schoolmaster, to keep everybody in line, because everyone was immature and they needed a grown-up to tell them how to live. But when you reach maturity, you don't need a schoolmaster telling you how to live anymore, because you learn how to make your own carefully thought-out, wise decisions, yes? Right? This, this is what Paul, Paul's argument is. And it reminds me of a parenting course I did when I was... Um, I mean, I failed, but it's, it's trying to work out how to raise my children properly, right? And they said one thing that really stuck with me. They talked about parenting in the funnel, right? You know what a funnel looks like. Well, it was an inverted funnel, sorry. So the funnel. 
And so, so when your kids are young, you're in this really narrow space and really it comes down to don't do this, do that, you know, because kids haven't got reasoning capacity and you can't have a lengthy conversation about, you know, don't stick the knife in the PowerPoint for these reasons. It's like, just don't, right? So, so there's this. But as your kids get older, that's not going to serve them very well at all because they're going to come up against increasingly more and complex situations. And, and if all they ever do is, is need something prescribed for them in terms of when you hit this situation, do this, when you're in this situation, do that, that list is going to be infinitely long, right? And so what they talked about was as your kids get older, you begin to talk to them about the moral reason why. You begin to say to them, here's how you could think about this. And then hopefully from that, they'll be able to extrapolate that out as they get older into many and different situations so that when they're in situations, they're thinking about what is the wise or the best decision to make in this situation, not what is the rule for what I have to do here. Yeah, with me on this? Okay. So this is why there's such a big pushback about that Paul is pushing back on this stuff and why I feel it's important for us to understand too is that we are, called, we are grown-ups in Jesus. Like we, we, We're meant to be mature people in Jesus. And the mark of maturity is not having to live by rules. It's about being able to live by the Spirit. And so when we fill ourselves with the Spirit, when we are filled with the Jesus and formed more into the likeness of, of Jesus, we can encounter all sorts of situations in the world where we don't have to worry about what is the rule around this. We're constantly asking ourselves and listening to what the Spirit is saying about how we are to navigate that situation. So, I said last week, we don't have a boundary line around here to demarcate between who's in and who's out or a list of rules that you need to comply with. We have a centre, and that is Jesus. And your place here is determined solely by your relationship to that centre. That's it. That's all we're interested in, your relationship with that centre, nothing else. We don't want you to jump through hoops we don't, to make you feel like you belong. We don't want you to be a good Christian, whatever on earth that is. And we'd want, we want you to continually grow closer to Jesus and grow up in him because we believe that the closer you are to Jesus, the better choices you will make and the greater fruit you will produce. Yeah. That's, that's all. Okay, and in that, in that, that far exceeds any rules we might set for you. So, I rest my case. Thank you. We are now going to go and have um, some communion, something we do every week around here, and we practice an open table where we invite everyone to come and to gather round Jesus, the body and the blood of Jesus, and to remind ourselves it is by grace we are saved through faith, right? So I invite everyone to come and take this and then we'll get the team up. Thank you very much.